To Autumn is the final ode of the series of six that John Keats wrote in 1819. It was inspired by a walk taken through the countryside near Winchester in Hampshire on Tuesday 21st of September 1819. In a letter to his friend John Hamilton Reynolds, Keats wrote, How beautiful the season is now, how fine the air, a temperate sharpness about it, I never liked Stubblefield so much as now. I better than the chilly green of spring. Somehow a stubble field looks warm, in the same way that some pictures look warm. This struck me so much in my Sunday's walk that I composed upon it. In the poem, Keats creates an image of the season as a force of growth and maturation but he also contemplates the inevitable death that follows. In a letter to Fanny Braun, whom he had met and fallen hopelessly in love with the previous year, at about the same time as he was nursing his brother Tom through his final battle with tuberculosis, he wrote, I have two luxuries to brood over in my walks, your loveliness and the hour of my death. The way in which he evokes in this poem a concentrated period of almost feverish productivity, followed by a gentle decline, is almost prescient in the way it seems to foreshadow his own demise. Little did he know that as he composed this poem, he was actually in the autumn of his own life. Six months after completing it, he experienced the first symptoms of the tuberculosis which would go on to kill him in 1821, at the age of 25. To Autumn was to be his last major poetic work. Keats, along with his contemporaries Percy Bysshe Shelley and George Gordon Byron, was a second-generation romantic poet. He believed in the power and beauty of nature, and that contemplation of it was fundamental to reach truth. He also believed that the perception of nature was achieved through all of the senses, not only through sight and sound, but through its colours, perfumes and shapes, and these are all present in this poem. The poem is in the form of an ode, which is a piece of verse praising or glorifying an event or an individual. Here, the object of Keats's appreciation is a personification of the season of autumn, whom we can argue he sees as a woman. Keats associates autumn with fertility, and Roman and Greek fertility deities are often, although not always, constructed as female. Additionally, Autumn is only able to achieve her work through a union with the maturing sun, who is referred to as a male. The poem is 33 lines long, divided into three stanzas of 11 lines each. The poem has a rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, E, D, C, C, E in the first stanza, and A, B, A, B, C, D, E, C, D, D, E in the second and third stanzas. It has a base metre of iambic pentameter. Didum, 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 didum. Although Keats does vary the rhythm in places, with the substitution of metrical feet, such as trochees, dumdi, spondees, Dum Dum and Pyrrhix Didi. There are only six sentences in the whole poem, three of which are rhetorical questions. Keats punctuates clauses with semicolons and colons, and uses conjunctions such as and and or to connect his ideas and to give the poem a sense of momentum and continuity. He also employs a significant amount of anastrophe, which is the reversal of word order in a sentence, e.g. conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run. 
If we move the syntax around a bit so that it is correct, the sentence reads, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruits the vines that run round thatch eaves. Poets do this for a number of reasons, including setting up a rhyme for another line and, through its formal tone, to give a sense of importance and depth. An astrophe can make a poem seem harder to understand than it actually is. And for initial comprehension purposes, it's a good idea to put the sentence back into the correct syntax so that you can get to grips with the meaning before looking at how any techniques enhance this. The three stanzas divide the progression of the poem and the season into three distinct phases. In the first, it is implied that it is morning during the transition between late summer and early autumn. There is a focus on ripeness and fruitfulness, and the senses Keats appeals to here are taste and touch. In the second stanza, the day has progressed into the afternoon, and we are now midway through autumn. There is a focus on the well-earned rest which precedes the harvest, and here Keats appeals to our sense of sight and, briefly, smell. In the third stanza, it is now twilight during late autumn, with the onset of winter in the air. The poet focuses on the inevitable decline in the natural world, as he appeals to our sense of hearing. Keats employs rich and sensuous vocabulary and dense sound patterning techniques, such as alliteration, consonants and assonance throughout, to create a poem of lyrical beauty. The poem begins with one of the most famous lines of English poetry, Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness. Mists are commonplace during autumn mornings due to the longer nights and the cooling of the air, leading to the moisture in it condensing into droplets. The word mists has connotations of softness, fuzziness and things being slightly out of focus. The adjective mellow means pleasantly smooth or soft or mature. Its original meaning in late Middle English was ripe, sweet and juicy. Fruitfulness means an abundance of fruit or fertility. Note that Keats breaks the iambic rhythm in the very first metrical foot with the substitution of a trochee, dumdi, for the usual iam. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness. This metrical inversion sets the word season slightly apart from the rest of the line and gives it prominence. In the second line, Keats uses personification to describe autumn as a close bosom friend of the maturing sun. A close bosom friend is a best friend with whom you confide the secrets of your bosom or heart, and maturing means ripening or bringing to a state of readiness. Once more, Keats disrupts the iambic rhythm with the substitution of a spondy this time for the iam in the first metrical foot and a pyrrhic for the I am in the third metrical foot, close bosom friend of the maturing sun. The spondy here emphasises the adjective close, as well as the first syllable of bosom, and highlights the intimacy of the relationship. Keats sees Autumn working in harmony with the sun as she conspires with him how to load and bless with fruits the vines that round the thatch eaves run. Conspiring means plotting secretly and is usually meant in a negative way to do something illicit. But here we can see that it means orchestrating the process together intimately, almost behind the scenes, as the burgeoning of the natural world takes pride of place. The rest of the stanza lists what Autumn and the Sun are actually conspiring to do, e.g. to load and bless, to bend and fill, to swell and plump, and to set budding. And this adds to the sense of abundance. 
All of these verbs relate to the mellow fruitfulness of the first line and have positive connotations of either weight, growth or movement. The word vines relates to the slender climbing stems upon which grapes grow and the thatcheaves around which these run are the bottom overhanging parts of the thatched cottage roofs. In the orchard surrounding these rural dwellings are cottage trees covered in moss, the branches of which are bending under the weight of the apples they bear, and all fruit is filled with ripeness to the core. Note the alliteration of the f sound and the consonants of the l here to enhance the softness and sweetness of the fruit. The gourds or pumpkins are swelling and the hazel shells or the shells of the hazelnuts on the trees are being plumped with a sweet kernel, which is the softer, edible part of the nut. The budding of the later flowers seems to be never-ending, the abundance of which is enhanced by the way in which Keats uses repetition across the line break, along with the adverb still. More and still more. The poet anthropomorphises the bees, whom he believes think these warm days will never cease, as they make the most of this idyllic time to or brim or fill to overflowing their clammy cells or the honeycomb in their hives with honey. If we go back to the first couple of lines and look at the sound patterning that is going on here, we can see that there is dense alliteration and consonants of m, l, f and s sounds. These are the same sounds that we find in the word mellifluous, which means sweet sounding, literally flowing as if with honey. And these communicate the same sweet sounding tone or euphony which enhances the beauty, softness and sweetness of the moment that Keats is trying to convey. In fact, we can see this mellifluous consonance pervades the entire first stanza. The structure of this first stanza is also very interesting. The subject of the sentence that makes up the whole of this verse is Autumn herself, but she is not governed by a finite verb, which is a conjugated verb in a particular tense, e.g. the past or present, and a particular number, i.e. singular or plural. The word conspiring, which is what autumn is doing, is a present participle and needs an auxiliary or helping verb, such as is or was, to complete it. The lack of an auxiliary verb means that this is in fact a minor sentence, i.e. a sentence which is incomplete and yet can still be understood. This lack of a tense and Keats's repeated use of the infinitive, either explicitly, e.g. to load, or implicitly, e.g. to fill, enhances the sense of continual and seemingly never-ending growth and abundance. Keats also enjams a number of these lines here, which requires the reader to carry on without pausing for breath. The words spill over from the end of one line to the beginning of the next, as though they cannot be contained either. If the first stanza is all about growth and maturation, the second stanza concerns itself with the harvest. The fruits of autumn's labour have been gathered in as both the day and the season reach their midpoint. Now that the harvest is in, autumn seems to be running out of energy and, for a stanza which seems implicitly to be about labour, much of the poet's diction relates to words with connotations of languor and stasis, e.g. sitting, sound asleep, drowsed, spares, steady, patient and watchest. It's possible that this is because the harvest is a process driven by humans rather than by nature, and as far as autumn is concerned, her work is done.
it starts with a rhetorical question. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Or, who hasn't often seen you amongst your harvested crops? The archaic and familiar thee and thy, instead of you and your, is used as a term of endearment and communicates the tenderness of the poet's feelings for the season. The stanza continues, Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind. Here the word abroad is used in its now archaic sense of out of doors. The word careless can mean either carefree or negligent, and may in this context actually mean both. Autumn is carefree because her work is almost done, and this is further enhanced by the serenity of the description of her hair, as it is soft lifted by the winnowing wind. The adjective winnowing here describes the way in which the lighter chaff, or seed covering, is removed from the grain during threshing. The softness of the consonant ft sounds, and the alliteration of the w in combination with the assonant short i sounds, in a stanza otherwise dominated by long vowel sounds, particularly long e sounds, seems to mimic the breathiness of the gentle wafting of the breeze as it rises and falls. She is, however, also negligent, as she can be found on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while her hook spares the next swathe and all its twined flowers. The tone of these lines is lazy and languorous, and there is an implication that autumn is intoxicated. Poppies are associated with the production of opium, which was a drug widely smoked, particularly in the artistic communities of Europe, during the 19th century. The way in which these flowers are entwined or interweaved with the stalks of the wheat is very sensuous and also implies a sense of stasis, as though they are holding on to the crop and not letting it go. Keats continues with a simile as he describes autumn as like a gleaner. A gleaner was a person who gathered what the reapers had left behind in the field, and up to 1788, some 30 years before this poem was written, gleaning was a legal right for cottagers or landless peasants. It's possible that Keats is making a very subtle political point here, that autumn and therefore nature is for freedom and is therefore on the side of the poor and not the rich landowners. He imagines this gleaner as someone who is carrying a heavy sack of grain across a brook or small stream, carefully balanced on his head. The words steady and laden here have connotations of slowness and heaviness. The stanza ends with the image of autumn by a cider press with patient look, watching the last oozings hour by hour. The apples that were ripening in the first stanza have been gathered and are now being pressed to make the apple juice that will be fermented to become cider. Autumn is described as patient here, as the pressing of the apples is done thoroughly to get every last drop of juice from them. The word oozings with its long oo sound suggests that the last drops of juice are the thickest and the sweetest. The repeated long ow sounds and the consonants of the z sounds in hours by hours, echoing the long vowel sound and the z in oozings, forces the reader to slow down. The final stanza also starts with not one, but two rhetorical questions, as a melancholy and wistful tone creeps in. Where are the songs of spring? Aye, where are they? as the poet appears to lament the season's lack of the melodious bird song that characterises spring. The second rhetorical question is known as an ubi sunt, which is Latin literally for where are they, 
which often appear in poetic meditations on mortality and the transience or temporary quality of nature. The way in which this question reiterates the first suggests a certain despair. In the second line, however, Keats directs an imperative at autumn, commanding her to think not of them, as he reassures her that thou hast thy music too. She does have music, just of a different kind. The day and the season are reaching their end point, as barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. The sun is setting and its rosy hue, or pink-coloured light, is reflecting off the barred clouds, which are thin clouds shaped like horizontal strips. Although this light makes the stubble fields appear warm, as noted by Keats in his letter to a friend, they're still bare, as communicated by the use of the word plains, and the light is reflected or borrowed and will soon be gone from the soft dying day. This is Keats's first reference to death, but note that it is not a violent death, but more of a gradual decline. The sounds of nature are also melancholy, as then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn among the river sallows borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies. Gnats are small flying insects which live near water, and male gnats swarm at dusk. Here their movement, and presumably their sound, is controlled by the light wind which bears them aloft or makes them sink as it lives or dies. Note that the words Keats chooses here, such as wailful choir, mourn and dies, form a semantic field relating to funerals. The music provided by the gnats is not melodious, and this is added to by the loud bleating of the full-grown lambs from hilly Bourne. The word bourne is a poetic way of saying boundary or limit, and we get the sense that they are far away. The bleating of newborn lambs is associated with spring and new life, but these lambs are full grown. This is a paradox. A full grown lamb cannot be a lamb because surely it must now be a sheep. These lambs are going to be cut off in their prime, however, as they will be slaughtered for eating before they become sheep. And so this is another subtle reference to death. They have done as much growing as they are going to, and are, for all intents and purposes, full grown. The plosion of the onomatopoeic bleat and its consonants with born are the first harsh sounds that we come across, and adds to the growing sense of melancholy. These sounds are joined by the hedge crickets, who are singing and the whistle with treble soft of the red breast from a garden croft. Redbreast is, of course, another word for the robin, with which we associate winter. The final line ends with the poignant image of the gathering swallows twittering in the skies as they get ready to migrate south for the winter. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.